Thank you. As stated, the next item of business is a statement by Shirley Ann Somerville on widening access to higher education. The Minister will take questions at the end of her statement, so there should be no interventions or interruptions. I call on Shirley Ann Somerville. Minister, ten minutes or thereabouts, please. Presiding officer, this government wants every child, no matter their background, to have an equal chance of going to university. Statistics show that currently that is not the case. Where you are born, the area you grow up in, conspires to make that harder, much harder, for young people from Scotland's most deprived backgrounds. That is not acceptable. That is why this government established a commission on widening access and accepted all 34 recommendations in its blueprint for fairness. Crucially, we accepted its ambitious targets to widen access so that by 2030, 20% 20 of students entering university will be from Scotland's 20% most deprived backgrounds. The government also agreed to report on progress one year on, and I welcome the opportunity to do so today. And I can also advise that we have published a written report of progress, which is now available on the Scottish Government website. And I want to make clear, presiding officer, that not only are we making progress in relation to delivering the blueprint recommendations, but that there are also clear signs of progress in terms of outcomes for our young people. The latest figures from UCAS from 2016 show a record percentage of 18-year-olds from the most deprived areas in Scotland entering university. The entry rate of 10.9% represents a proportional increase of 51% since 2006. What these statistics show is that there is change, just not at the pace that is required. And that's why the Widening Access Commission set out five foundational recommendations which it determined were necessary to deliver the step change required. And I can advise Parliament that two of those foundational recommendations have been implemented and the rest are currently on target to deliver to timescale. In December, I was pleased to announce the appointment of Professor Sir Peter Scott as Scotland's Commissioner for Fair Access. His knowledge, experience and commitment to equality and fairness are already playing a pivotal role in driving forward the system-wide approach required to create equal access. And I want that to continue so that I can announce that Sir Peter has agreed to continue as Commissioner for a further year. Indeed, it is the Commissioner who is tasked with delivering the framework for fair access a framework that sets out what works and how to deliver it, a framework based on robust evidence. Professor Scott has been clear that those working on access should play a key role in the development of the framework and that its main purpose should be to support and enhance the work they do. To achieve this, he has convened a development group chaired by Conor Ryan, a former Commission member and Director of Research and Communications with the Sutton Trust. The framework will be published in 2018 and will effectively set out a route map for delivery of fair access. The foundational recommendations also set an immediate challenge for government to provide a full bursary for students with care experience and for universities to guarantee them an offer of a place. I can advise that from this academic year 2017-18, care experience students under 26 can apply for a bursary of £7,625 to support living costs. This mirrors the current minimum income guarantee for the least well-off students in higher education and will make a real difference to some of our most vulnerable young people. We have taken an inclusive approach to determine and defining care experience, listening carefully to the voices and views of people with care experience themselves. The result is that already over 100 young people with care experience have been awarded a bursary for study in 2017-18. And we have been assured by institutions and by University Scotland that care experience is already considered during the admissions processes. It is vital, however, that this translates into students applying for entry in 2017 who meet at least the minimum admission standards being offered a place at university. The final foundational recommendation concerned the 2030 target and the milestones to be met in terms of increasing access in 2021 and 2026. It also included the target for individual universities that by 2021, students from the 20% most deprived background should represent 10% of all full-time first degree entrants at each university in Scotland. The Scottish Funding Council has integrated these targets into its outcome agreement guidance. Further, from 2018-19, institutions have been advised that they will be expected to use the additional widening access places solely to support the intake of students from the 20% most deprived areas in Scotland. And I want to be clear today about my expectations of our universities. We can be very proud of our world-class university sector and the success they deliver. Indeed, only last week, statistics were published showing that in 2016, 35.8% of workers in Scotland aged 25 to 64 were graduates, the highest percentage on record. 
But there is also disparity between the universities in terms of the backgrounds of young people who study in them. That must change. Every young person must have equal chances and choices to study at any of our Scottish institutions. And so my first expectation for the coming year is that the Scottish Funding Council will ensure that the access targets being set through the outcome agreement process are sufficient to deliver our interim targets. And by this, I mean not only the overarching national targets, but all those for institutions and for full-time first-degree entrants. I also expect the Funding Council to monitor progress to identify where targets are not being met or where more challenging targets are required. And I expect this to be done in a transparent way to set out clearly and publicly the access-related activity and ambitions being set by institutions through the outcome agreement process and to report the progress being made against them. Implementation of the Commission's recommendations in relation to university admissions will be key to achieving these milestones and targets. In addition to more transparency around the admissions process, the Commission recommended that all universities should set access thresholds by 2019. I'm pleased that University Scotland has commenced work on this through an admissions working group. This is one of three working groups, with the other two focusing on articulation and bridging programmes. All three groups are due to report by early autumn, after which universities will then have to start implementing the recommendations. I welcome the leadership that University Scotland has shown in those areas. I am, how also, acutely aware of the lead-in time that institutions need to make changes to admissions processes and to ensure that these are communicated to prospective students in time for them to apply. Over the next 12 months, I would therefore expect universities to make clear and demonstrable progress in this area that will ensure delivery of access thresholds in time for the academic year 2019-20. Presiding officer, progress has also been made on a programme of work to take forward the data recommendations. The Commission was clear. Although the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation is the most robust measure we have at this time, we must develop more comprehensive methodology to identify the backgrounds of students. My officials are liaising with universities to identify the data they currently use and need going forward. The evidence base in this area is growing, with new research published in December and further research from Durham University due later this year. A group is now being established to determine the best measures to use and will deliver this work by 2018 in line with the Commission's recommendations. Presiding officer, in the past year we've created an enabled space within which all our stakeholders in this agenda could explore and establish their thinking on how best to implement the blueprint for fairness. But the Commission was clear that a whole system approach would be needed to achieve our aim. That therefore requires the whole education system to work together to deliver collectively on the blueprint's recommendations. And I can therefore announce today the, delivery, the establishment of a delivery group to coordinate and monitor progress of implementation across all parts of the education system. This group will include those with a key responsibility for delivering aspects of change and by individuals and representatives with a wider stake in the outcome of our actions, such as NUS Scotland. It will, of course, involve Sir Peter Scott, our Commissioner for Fair Access, and in recognition of the important, importance governance places on this group, I will be chairing that myself. Presiding Officer, this Government's work to reduce inequalities in higher education did not start and will not end with the Commission's recommendations. We have introduced statutory access agreements and have invested £128 million in widening access and articulation places over the last four years. This year, we also introduced 40 new places through our pre-medical entry programme, which aims to assist students from socially deprived backgrounds to enter medicine. Implementing the blueprint for fairness is undoubtedly challenging for everyone involved, but it also provides a significant opportunity to change our education system and in the process change the lives of the young people who need equal chances and choices the most. The progress I have set out today demonstrates that we are determined to address the challenge in order to deliver that opportunity. Thank you very much, Minister. The Minister will now take questions on the issues raised in a statement. I intend to allow around 20 minutes with perhaps a little bit extra for questions, but please try to ask questions, not long statements, after which we'll move on to the next item of business. The help of members who wish to ask a question, we press the request to speak buttons now, and I call on Liz Smith to be followed by Ian Gray. Ms Smith, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and can I thank the Minister for prior sight? And can I also very much welcome the work that has already been undertaken by Sir Peter Scott, by the universities themselves, by University Scotland, and obviously by the Scottish Funding Council. Could I ask, however, two very important questions? Firstly, 
whether the Scottish Government will address the concerns of Audit Scotland about the overall financial sustainability of the higher education sector and whether this will include the necessary financial resources to expand the number of university places so that there is minimum displacement of better off students, many of whom are finding it harder to get into university these days despite having top quality entry qualifications. And secondly, according to the UCAS statistics that the Minister uh, mentioned herself, while the number of students from deprived backgrounds going to university is rising in Scotland, we still do lag behind very considerably um, by quite a bit actually in percentage points from other UK jurisdictions. So could the Minister explain why she thinks that that is happening and what plan she has to provide more bursary support? Minister. Can I thank Liz Smith for those um, questions? Um, she will be well aware that once again the Scottish Government is investing over <coughs> £1 billion in the higher education sector, which demonstrates our commitment to the sector and our belief in the worldwide, uh, the world leading um, reputation that our higher education institutions have. She talks about the number of places and uh, an increase in the number of places as if there is a simple solution to widening access and all we have to do is increase the number of places. Um, now, this is a debate which, of course, um, is relevant and, and should be had, but we must bear in mind that there are other countries um, where um, we can, they can keep on increasing the number of places and they still have a challenge around widening access. This is something the Commissioner himself brought up when um, in front of the Education Committee when he talked about an increasing number of places not being the answer to dealing with widening access. And the issue of displacement I know is something which um, Liz Smith has brought up um, previously. But it doesn't recognise um, what came through very clearly in the Commission's work, that uh, there is a, an inherent unfairness, a systematic unfairness um, about the way that we currently distribute the publicly funded places that we have. That was very well uh, demonstrated in the Commission's uh, work. We can't simply um, assume that the best people are going to university or the best people will get to university if we continue to increase the number of places. It's much more um, complex than that. So the government is obviously um, continuing to invest in widening access places um, through the Scottish um, Funding Council, um, and that is playing dividends. But we need to see um, um, a much more detailed um, solution to that, and that's what I expect to come through through the framework for fair access, which the Commissioner's um, developing. Lastly, she talks about um, UK comparisons. Um, and uh, I, I would add some caution about making UK comparisons, uh, not because um, um, the Scottish Government thinks so, but it's also something which UCAS themselves say um, isn't helpful because um, we are comparing two very different systems. The figures, for example, down in England uh, do not discuss the, the wide um, ranging subjects that take place in our college sector. And we simply can't compare two different systems um, and look at the Scottish system up here and not recognise the amount of places uh, that we have within our college sector which also develop um, higher education um, within them. So that's something which the Commission again recognised and indeed recommended on them. Our officials are working with officials from across the UK to look at how we can make UK comparisons, but so that we can make a genuine comparison comparing like with like. And I think that's the only way where we can provide a better solution at the end of that. Ian Gray, followed by Jenny Gilruth. Thank you, President Officer, and uh, thanks to the Minister for early sight uh, of her statement. The Government's purpose here that every child, no matter their background, should have an equal chance of going to university is one we certainly share. Uh, and I welcome this uh, update and the progress that has been made. But I also agree with the Minister that the pace of progress uh, is too slow. Indeed, the 2021 target of students from the 20% most deprived backgrounds representing at least 16% of full-time first degree entrance to university is a mere four years away now. Uh, the Minister uh, used the figure in her statement for 18-year-olds, but the Funding Council figures for under 21 entrants show that it has taken 10 years to get from 8.7% to 10.4%, and in fact, the figure fell back slightly uh, in the last year uh, that they have, 2015-16. Uh, Does the Minister 
really have confidence that the measures announced today will produce a leap from 10 to 16 per cent in only four years. And secondly, the, the minister um, uh, was sceptical there uh, about simple solutions, but one measure which researchers such as the Sutton Trust have recognised as being effective was the ring-fenced funding of additional widening access places. But this was abolished in 2016 uh, as a result of higher education uh, funding cuts. So uh, will the minister reinstate that ring-fenced funding in order to meet the urgency of that looming 2021 target? Minister. Well, Eden Gray is quite right to point out the challenge of um, reaching the interim targets. I've set out in my statement um, the work that the Scottish Government will do, uh, the work that the Scottish Funding Council um, will do. Much of this, however, will be um, completed by the institutions themselves. As uh, members in this chamber are, are quick to point out to me, um, um, they are... Um, um, independent institutions um, from government and we need to work together with the sector to ensure that they are up um, to, to meeting that challenge as well. That's what I've laid out um, what I have around outcome agreements about ensuring that there is um, full transparency and an openness um, about how much there is a challenge within certain institutions um, to ensure that they reach their targets and also looking at it institution by institution. Uh, there are many that are doing um, exceptionally well both in widening access and in articulation and others it would be fair to say um, not as well as they should be and we need to, to shine a light on that practice to share the good practice. So he's right to point out to um, a, a, a challenge with the, the pace of change. And that's exactly why um, I've announced um, the foundation of the delivery group, so we can bring together um, those individuals who are responsible for delivering that change, both inside and outside uh, government, so that we can work together uh, towards that implementation. Um, one of the most important parts will be around access uh, thresholds and universities um, not only having the working groups, um, not only reporting from the working groups, but then implementing that recommendation. And that will have to be done quickly to allow the prospectuses to be put in place um, to meet the timetables. Um, we are, uh, as a government, continuing to invest in widening access uh, places. And we have ensured that we will continue um, to, to do that. Uh, and I pointed out within my statement about how we're actually moving forward, for example, in medical places uh, to ensure that we're looking at the work that's required um, within um, medical training to, to develop um, greater widening access around that. So it's something that the government uh, continues to take very seriously and continues to invest in. I have 10 backbenchers wanting to ask questions, so I've got to ask, please, for crisp questions and crisp answers, please. Jenny Gilruth, be followed by Jeremy Balfour. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and remind members I'm the PLO to the Education Secretary. Uh, when we think about widening access to... No, I want a question. I expect you to set an example. Start with a question, please. Can the Minister outline what role she sees for colleges as part of the widening access agenda? Minister. Um, we very much do recognise uh, within the government the important role that colleges uh, do play in widening access. They often open the door um, for the first time to further and higher education from those from disadvantaged backgrounds. And articulation in particular is a stepping stone for those um, who begin at college and uh, move on to a degree, degree level. That's why um, I'm very keen to see further work on articulation and indeed articulation with full credit. I'm pleased that University of Scotland has developed um, a work stream around this. The importance we place on college is demonstrated by the, com the fact that the Commissioner will include a representative in the Framework for Fair Access group and I will include a delivery, um, uh, uh, someone from the college sector within the delivery group um, that I've just announced. Jeremy Balfour followed by James Dornan. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and can I thank the Minister for her statement. Can, can I go back to a point uh, raised by my colleague uh, Liz Smith? Uh, what advice would she give to parents um, whose children are no longer going to be offered a university place? because they don't, are not in that percentage. Should they go to England? Should they go to a job? What advice would you give Short to question, don't develop it. Minister? 
Well, what I would say to, um, to any parents and indeed to any young person is that um, they have a Scottish Government who is determined to ensure that all young people will have fair access and fair opportunity to universities in Scotland. It will be done so on the basis of free education so that we do not um, burden students um, with the level of debt that we're seeing uh, down in England. Uh, and I, I I, I struggle to, to, to think why Jeremy Balfour would, would, would um, want to, to um, encourage us to look to what's happening in England, not only because of the level of debt that's happening down there, but by the fact that the UK government has taken away maintenance grants uh, from new entrants into university. Uh, that's not something that this Scottish government will be following, and I think every parent in the country will be pleased that we're doing that. James Dornan, followed by Daniel Johnson. Thank you, President Officer. I'm delighted to see the Government has delivered on its commitment to introduce a full bursary for care-experienced young people. Can the Minister explain the inclusive approach she alluded to in more detail and how the age limit of 26 was arrived at? Minister. Well, we considered very carefully the options for eligibility for the bursary, and this was based on a range of evidence and discussions which my officials and I had with stakeholders, including from Who Cares Scotland. We take a very inclusive approach to that eligibility. Anyone who's been looked after by a local authority is considered care experience for this bursary, with no time scale applied to that care experience, which might limit that eligibility. The age limit was arrived at to align with the current legislation to provide continuing care to young people leaving care up to the age of 26 in Scotland. And I was delighted to, to meet um, some care experienced students at Strathclyde University this morning um, and discuss with them the real difference it will make to them um, and uh, to others within the sector and encourage uh, care experienced young people uh, to get into to university. Um, and I was delighted to see that real progress being made this morning. Daniel Johnson, followed by Claire Hockey. Uh, thank you. Uh, given that the government cut the maximum bursary available by almost £1,000 in 2013, can the Minister confirm that the issue of student cost of living will be looked at by the development and delivery groups and that they will examine the restoration and indeed the improvement of bursary levels and eligibility thresholds? Minister. Well, as the member will no doubt be aware, there is a review of student support um, ongoing at this time. Um, and um, given that that is an independent um, review from government, um, they, will, um, they will look at a variety of different um, aspects um, of the delivery, both within higher education and further education and its impacts on students. Um, I'm aware that the Commission recommendations suggested that the Commissioner carry out his own research into student finance. Um, he's chosen not to do so at this point, given the fact that there's an independent review already ongoing. But the Commissioner has met with the Chair of the View, Jane Ann Gadia, uh, to discuss um, their work to ensure uh, that there is no duplication and no gaps between that. Uh, so they're working very closely together and the Commissioner will draw his own conclusions about whether um, he does want to make um, any further recommendations um, or uh, carry out any research on this uh, with his, within his own work programme. Claire Hockey followed by Ross Greer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Minister outline how contextual admissions and access thresholds will ensure that talent is evaluated fairly and whether universities already offering grade adjustments have experienced a drop-off in academic standards? Minister. Well, Claire Hockey is very um, right to point out that many universities already use um, contextualised data um, within the institutions and many of them make significant adjustments to entry tariffs. Um, none of them have seen um, a, a drop-off in standards um, within that. And again, it's something which I discussed with the admission officers at Strathclyde um, this morning. Um, they again um, spoke about the fact that there was no drop-off in standards um, because of contextualised admissions. Um, and it's very important that we recognise that there is a, a growing evidence out there which suggests that grades alone are a completely inadequate selection device uh, to, to, um, for universities um, to use. Um, pupils from the most disadvantaged backgrounds do just as well, if not better, than their more affluent players, even when their attainment on leaving school might um, be lower. So there's no reason um, for, for this to have any uh, disadvantage within the higher education um, institutions, uh, but there is real advantage to them um, developing this work um, still further and ensuring the good practice, which happens within some universities and some courses, um, goes throughout the entire system. Ross Greer, followed by Mike Rumbles. 
Thank you. Given that the Minister and the Commission have emphasised the need for a whole system approach, could the Minister clarify how the Government will ensure that barriers out with the education portfolio, such as increasingly expensive public transport and exploitation in the private rental sector, are also addressed and not lost in a siloed approach which focuses on widening access to the education portfolio? Minister, alone? your question is asked, Minister. Well, Ross Clear makes a, a very important point about we do look, need to look at a holistic um, um, considerations uh, to the challenges which are affecting um, students, whether it's um, the public transport, whether it's the um, cost of accommodation, both in halls or in the private rented sector. Um, all of this will have um, an impact on students as they go through their university um, career. And it's something which I'm, I'm very, very uh, keen to ensure that when we're looking at widening access is that we don't just look at widening access to fresher spheres, but we continue to ensure that we're looking at widening access um, to people completing um, their degree programme and completing it successfully. All of those challenges will need to be borne in mind as we do so. Mike Rumbles, followed by Ruth McGuire. I thank the Minister for the advanced copy of her statement. <clears throat> on Sunday, Andrew O'Neill pressed the First Minister five no, times... No, no, I want a question, Mr Rumbles. ...on Rumbles. the impact You're that not cutting special. grants has had for students from poorer backgrounds. I can come to the front bench if you want me to ask it from the front bench. You are a backbencher. I want your question, please. I am please. not a backbencher. I'm a front I bencher. want your question, please. Well, you can have my question. I'll ask it now. Does the Minister believe... Uh, Luke, sit down a minute. I'm not getting into Barney's. The front benchers who get longer here were Ms Smith and um, Ian Gray. You're not down to speak longer than anybody else. You ask your question just like everybody else. Please ask it now. I'll certainly take this up at the Bureau. Um, I dare you I'm... speak to me like that. You ask your question now, please, and take that back. Does the Minister believe that the decision to have I said the you value... should apologise to the Chair for that remark, Mr Rumbles. I I'm not happy. I'm, I'm not happy either, Deputy I President know you're officer. not, but I'm in the chair and you Indeed, had an odd question. Please respectful. sit down again. Please sit down and take a moment yourself. I'll take the next question while you're thinking about it. Ruth Maguire, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. What steps are the government and universities taking to ensure that young people not only get the chance to go to university, but can also sustain their place and complete their degree? Thank you. Minister, please. Well, as I, as I mentioned in a previous answer to, to Ross Gear, retention of students um, plays um, a very important part in the discussions we're having around um, widening access. There is a great amount of good practice which happens within our universities uh, to ensure that support is given to students um, of um, whatever um, background um, they come from. There is also indeed much to learn um, from what goes on within the further education sector and within colleges about the frontline support that is uh, given to them by the support staff within the colleges. All of that needs to be taken on board, a systemic approach um, to, to ensure that retention is taken um, very seriously by the universities, as I have every confidence it is. Alexander Burnett, followed by Stuart McMillan, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, can the Minister confirm that the next stages of progress can be made via the outcome agreements agreed by the Scottish Founding Council, Funding Council and by the institutions, and not by the introduction of further legislation? Minister, please. Well, as I said in my statement, we are placing um, a, a great deal of trust in the outcome um, agreements and ensuring that the, the fact that we are, will draw together that information um, in its totality so that each institution um, will have to uh, report in a very public fashion about how um, it succeeds uh, within the, the challenges it set for um, the, the, the developments going forward. <clears throat> the outcome agreements um, are something which are still relatively new within the Funding Council. Um, but uh, they do need to be taken very seriously, both by the universities, as I know they are, by the Funding Council. Uh, the Commission um, did suggest that uh, both Government and the Funding Council looked at other options if universities um, didn't um, live up to the challenge um, which has been presented to them. Um, but I'm confident, given um, the continued assurances I'm receiving from University Scotland, there is no reason for them not to succeed and not to meet the pace of change that is required. And I would expect them to live up to that challenge. Thank you, Stuart McMillan, to be followed by Mike Rumbles. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, how does the, the Minister intend delivering the blueprint for fairness, which advocates the whole system approach to achieving equal access and acknowledges that long-term change needs the involvement of the wider education system right from the earliest age? Minister. Well, Stuart, McDon um, Stuart McMillan is very right um, to point out that we do need a whole systems approach. It was something that the Commission itself took very seriously um, within its uh, deliberations. Uh, we intend to follow that through as the government, through the delivery group, um, to ensure that we better coordinate longer term work. So that will not only include, as I said during my statement, um, those who will deliver um, the recommendations uh, specifically mentioned within the Commission, uh, but also um, individuals and representatives from the wider education system who have a responsibility to uh, support, uh, to challenge uh, those of us um, who will be uh, responsible for delivery of those recommendations. So there will be a great deal of work um, undertaken to ensure that the widening access work that we do um, is taken very seriously across the entire um, education sector and that we continue to feed in not only what we're doing within the delivery group but also for example in our work of the review of the learner journey to ensure that that whole system approach is something which we deliver on. Mike Rumbles. Does the Minister believe that the decision to No, halt... Mr Rumbles, I must have an apology first. I'm sorry. Deputy Presiding Officer, I do apologise if there seems to be Thank a misunderstanding between Thank you very much. Now, just, just ask your question. Thank you. Does the Minister believe that the decision to halve the value of grants and bursaries in the last five years is coherent with the objectives of widening access? Minister. I thank Mike Rumbles for that question. Um, we have, um, as I've already um, said to, to Mike Rumbles, uh, the Scottish Government has a review of student support ongoing under the chair of Jane Ann Gadia, who will look very seriously um, at the issues of, of student support. I should remind the member, however, that um, the level of student debt within Scotland um, is still the lowest in comparison to the rest of the UK. And the changes that were made um, that um, have been uh, referred to um, were done to ensure a mini minimum income guarantee and a combination of bursaries and loans. But it is something we um, have agreed uh, to review and I look forward to the independent um, review chaired by Jane Ann uh, bringing forward recommendations to me in due course. Thank you very much. That concludes questions to the Minister. And we'll move on to the next side of my business, allow members an opportunity to take up their places. Short pause.